So at the end of Acts 15, two new teams are formed. Barnabas takes John Mark with him and sails for Cyprus. He's going the same route on, the second, on his second missionary journey that he and Paul and John Mark went on in the first missionary journey. So two-thirds of the first team go out on the second journey. Now, Paul does not go alone. Remember, Silas had been sent from Jerusalem to Antioch to deliver the conclusions of the Council of Jerusalem. Silas stays at Antioch. He preaches and teaches in Antioch. So when Paul and Barnabas split up and they both go out on their second missionary journey, John Mark goes with Barnabas Silas goes with Paul. Now, that's the new team. Now, the Holy Spirit, inspiring Luke, does not focus on Barnabas and John Mark. Does that mean that they didn't do anything important? Did that mean that they were disobedient? Did that mean that their story is not interesting? No, it doesn't mean any of those things. But for some reason, God chose Paul to be the model of the faithful life and the life of the missionary theologian. You know, there were 12 disciples. One of them hung himself. But what do you hear about these other disciples? You hardly hear anything about any, anyone except for James, and, and who was killed, and John, and Peter. But what do you hear of Philip? What do you hear of Bartholomew? What do you hear of the other James? What do you hear of Judas, not Iscariot? They all had significant ministries. Probably, as best we can tell, Thomas took the gospel all the way to India. There's a strong and good tradition that Christianity was begun in India by Thomas, who himself was martyred on the seashore, killed by the local people for the sake of the gospel. But Scripture only focuses on a few of them. And now the focus of the second missionary journey will not be the second missionary journey taken by Barnabas. It will be rather the second missionary journey taken by Paul with his new partner whose name was Silas, the last verse of Acts 15. Now, in our study so far, I have told you that probably the most important chapter in the book of Acts is Acts chapter 2. And I've told you that after the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, some Christians call that the founding of the church. Other Christians trace the church from the generation of Abraham. Christians are divided about when the church really starts, but certainly the church begins in a new phase, in what we might call a Holy Spirit phase or a new covenant phase on the day of Pentecost. So Acts chapter 2 is supremely important, probably the most important chapter in the book of Acts. Close behind chapter 2 in importance is chapter 9, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Tremendous importance, tremendous impact that the conversion of Saul of Tarsus had on the future of Christianity. I would say, just my opinion, Maybe you won't ever read this in a book or hear this from anybody else. The chapter which has the most spiritual lessons for us is chapter 16. The chapter that I would least want to be without, the chapter that I would most regret having to give up in terms of what helps me spiritually, what encourages me as a Christian, is Acts chapter 16. We're going to take a little bit longer on Acts 16 than we've taken on some of the other chapters. We didn't take very long on Acts 11 because mostly Acts 11 was a report on what happened in Acts 10. So we just looked at that for a very brief while. Why is Acts 16 important? Well, it's important because it's the story of the second missionary journey, now with Paul and Silas. It's also important 
because it's the story of the founding of the church in Europe. You see, it was Paul's intention to go to the same place, to go to the same places on the second missionary journey that he went to on the first missionary journey. And that place was on the Asian side of the Mediterranean Sea. But what happened in Acts 16 is, first of all, he didn't go with who he thought he was going to go with. He thought he was going to go with Barnabas. He didn't. Secondly, he thought he was going to go only to Asia Minor. Again, he didn't. Acts 16 is important because it records the founding of the church in Europe. History was changed in a dramatic way in Acts 16 when the apostles brought the gospel to Europe. And so we take it up uh, in, in verse 1. They go back first to Asia Minor, to the places where they were before. They even go back to the place called Lystra. Now you remember what happened in Lystra in chapter 14. That's the place where Paul healed the man who'd never been able to walk since birth, the man who was lame in his feet. And that's the place where they sacrificed to Paul and Barnabas as if they'd been gods, but then they turned on them and tried to kill them. And in fact, they thought they had killed Paul, and they stoned him. Remember that Paul returns to Lystra immediately after he recovers from the stoning. And he even returns to Lystra again a third time before we leave Acts 14. So he goes back to the place where he was beaten up and nearly killed. He goes back to the place where they hated him. He goes back to the place where apparently the ministry had failed. So what do you see in Acts 16? He goes back there again. Can you believe it? He goes back to the scene of apparent failure. And guess what? He discovers that the ministry there was not a complete failure. I don't know if this person he discovers there became a Christian through his preaching. I don't know if this person noticed him the first time, the second time, the third time, or all three times. I don't know if this person saw him raise the lame man and heal him. I don't know if this person saw him get stoned. I don't know if this person saw him tear his clothes and say, don't worship me, I'm just a man. All I know is that somewhere along the way, because of Paul's ministry in Lystra, this young man said, I want to be a minister. I want to be a missionary. I also want to travel and tell out this good news. What was the man's name? Timothy, Timothy. You see, the ministry looked like a complete failure, an absolute failure, but it wasn't. It wasn't a failure. God was working. God was working in the heart of somebody named Timothy, somebody that Paul writes two books of the New Testament, to somebody that he says in Philippians 3, there's no other Christian like this. This is the greatest Christian I know. This is the very best person I could send to you. And somebody who became the pastor of the church at Ephesus, Timothy. And so, here we have Silas is the replacement for Barnabas. And here we have Timothy as the replacement for John Mark. Verse 3 says that Paul wanted Timothy to go with him. And Timothy's mother was a Jew. His mother was a godly woman named Eunice or Eunice. His grandmother was a godly woman named Lois. His father, though, was a Gentile. And it says that they passed through the cities, they were delivering the decrees. What decrees? Well, the, the conclusions of the Council of Jerusalem. What was decided in Acts 15 
is being shared in Acts 16 in Asia Minor. And um, it says in verse 5 that the churches in Asia Minor were being strengthened in faith and that they were being that they were increasing in number. Now, notice what ha begins to happen in verse 6. Very, very important. They go through the Phry Phrygian and Galatian region. These were Roman districts in the Roman province of Asia. And when you see Asia in the New Testament, it doesn't mean the great landmass that includes Siberia and India and China and, and the Russian Pacific, it doesn't, that's not what Asia means. That's what Asia means today, but that's not what Asia meant in the first century. The first century, all Asia meant was the Roman province of Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey. And so this is where they went on the first missionary journey. This is where they went on the second missionary journey. And they tried to keep going to other places in Asia Minor. It says in verse 7, they were trying to go into Bithynia, but they couldn't. They passed by Messiah. They came to Troas. I guess for some reason they also couldn't stay in those places. It actually says in verse 6 that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. In other words, they could not have the ministry on the second journey that they had in the, on the first journey. They went to the same places, but they couldn't have the same ministry. Something was stopping them. Something was holding them back. Something was making it impossible. And Luke, who's writing the story in Acts 16, says that the thing that was making it impossible was God. God was keeping them from that ministry. It was the Holy Spirit who kept them from speaking that word. It was Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus, who would not permit them to have that ministry. We have a saying in English. I don't know if you have it in Russian. When God closes a door, He opens a window. And there are many people who try to do a certain thing for God in a certain place, in a certain way, and when it doesn't work, they decide, well, I'll do nothing for God. I tried to do this, it didn't work, so I'll quit. That's not what the apostles did. Paul doesn't pack his bags and go back to Antioch. He doesn't say, well, you know, I tried, I mean, I did my best, I went back there and it didn't work, so I'm going home. No. He understands that if God doesn't want us to do this thing, He wants us to do another thing. If He doesn't want us to minister in this place, that means He wants us to minister in another place. Verse 7 says, they were trying. They were trying. They were trying. They were trying to do something for God. There's a verse in Ephesians 5.10. I love that verse because it's so simple. You know, we can talk about the will of God and we can talk about the way that we find out what the will of God is and what God wants us to do and what God's calling us to do. In Ephesians 5.10, Paul says, I'm just trying to figure out what pleases the Lord. I'm just dis trying to discover what God wants. And, and that's just a very simple ambition that God has. What are you doing, Paul? I'm just trying to find out what God wants. It's nothing that mystical. It's nothing that complicated. But we do have to try. We do have to pay attention. We do try have to beat at this door. And if that doesn't work, we have to beat at another door until we find out what God wants. And what happens at that point is that Paul has a vision. And in the vision, he sees a man over on the European side of the Mediterranean who calls out to him, come on over and help us. We call this the Macedonian call. Macedonia was a province just to the north of Greece. Macedonia was the place where Philip was from and where Alexander was from. Philip of Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Greek, Greek, the great conquerors who spread Hellenistic culture throughout the known world. Now, um, I want to just stop a minute here and talk about something a little bit practical. How do you know what God wants you to do? How do you know what God is calling you to? 
what are you supposed to do? Well, you should assume that He wants you to do something. Why should, why should He leave you on earth if He didn't want you to do anything? You know, there are certain things that we can only do on earth that we cannot do in heaven. Did you know that? Do you know that you can't witness in heaven? You know that you can't lead people to Christ in heaven? You know that you can't talk to unbelievers in heaven? Did you know that? Because there aren't any unbelievers in heaven. There's nobody in heaven who doesn't know about Christ already. So the question is, why should God let you live? Why does God leave us here? Isn't it probably true that He allows us to live here so that we can do things here that we can't do there, that we can't do after we die, that we can't do when we get to heaven? And so Paul tries to do something and it doesn't work. He tries again and it doesn't work. Think of all the things that didn't work. He tried to go out with Barnabas and it didn't work. He tried to have the same ministry in Asia Minor and it didn't work. He tried to witness in the Phrygian and Galatian region and it didn't work. He tried to witness in Bithynia and it didn't work. But he doesn't quit. You see, we want the final decision, the product. God enjoys the process. God enjoys the process of us waiting, of us looking to Him and learning gradually what it is He wants us to do. Now, I ask the question, let me try to answer it. The question I ask is, how do you know what God wants you to do? Well, the first thing you do is you try to do something for Him. You do what you can. In Acts 9, we saw that Peter told Aeneas what Christ had done for him, and then he healed him. Can we heal people? Well, if we can, if you can heal somebody, heal them. But if you can't, tell them what Jesus has done for them. Then he goes to where Dorcas has died. He kneels by her bed. He prays, and then he raises her from the dead. Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, if you can raise somebody from the dead, raise them from the dead. But if you can't do that, do what you can do. What can you do? You can kneel down and beg God for the impossible. That's what Peter did. We can do that. Maybe we can't do the impossible, but we can ask God to do the impossible. And that's what Peter did. And so Paul was attempting to do something from the Lord. It wasn't working, but he kept trying. And then he was called and shown what to do by the Lord. Well, how was he called? Well, he was called through something supernatural. He was called by vision. He was called through a vision. Can God call us like that? Sure He can. Might it happen to you in the future? It might. It's not impossible. Has it ever happened to me? I'm older than all of you. It's never happened to me. Do I expect it to happen in the future? Not really. I would be lying to you if I tell you that I expected it to happen in the future. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying God can't do it. I'm not saying God won't do it. I'm just saying I'm not expecting anything like that. But that's one way God calls. He can call by sending a vision or sending a dream, or sending an angel. He could call you to do something like that. Do I think that He will? Well, I don't know that He won't. But maybe, maybe I don't really think that He will, but He could. That's one way. That's the way He called Paul. He can do it again. And I'm sure he is doing it again today with people, but he hasn't done it with me, and he may not do it with you. Well, how else does he call us? Well, I think he calls us by something that we might term compulsion. What does compulsion mean? Compulsion is when we, we have to do something because we can't do anything else. In 1992, I moved to Moscow. You know why? because I was compelled to move to Moscow. I, drew through, I drove through Moscow on Sunday, and I was amazed at how much better it looks in 2011 than it looked in 1992. Moscow looked awful in 1992. As a matter of fact, the only place that I could find in Moscow which was really beautiful in 1992 was Red Square. Red Square was really beautiful, especially at night. I drove across Moscow Sunday night and I saw so many beautiful places. It looked really great. 
but in 1992, I was living in one of the most beautiful cities of the world and one of the most beautiful regions of the world. I was living in Munich in Bavaria, a short distance from the Alps, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. But I moved to Moscow. Why? Because I couldn't help it. Because God compelled me to go. He made it important for me to go. The same thing happened to me in 2003 when I moved from Memphis to Budapest. I was compelled. Does the Bible talk about this? It does. Paul talks about this same thing in 1 Corinthians 9. Why was Paul a preacher? He was a preacher because he was compelled to be a preacher. It's something that God really forced him to do. He couldn't resist it. As a matter of fact, he says to the Corinthians, you don't need to give me credit for being a preacher of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, if I preach the gospel, I don't have anything to brag about. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, for I am under compulsion. If you want to know what the, what the Russian word is for compulsion, look in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, because that's where the word appears in the New Testament. I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I preach not the gospel. What does he mean, woe is me? Woe is the opposite of blessing. I'm cursed if I preach not the gospel. It's a disaster. It's a catastrophe. It's awful if I preach not the gospel. I've got to preach the gospel. I have no choice. I must do it. That's compulsion. And that's one way God calls us. Sometimes we do something because we can't help it. We can't, we can't do anything else. You know, sometimes God calls us by speaking to us in Scripture. We see a verse, and maybe the verse is out of context. Maybe the verse is not talking about our situation. But the verse grips us. It grabs hold of us, and it won't let go. And we say, well, you know, I wasn't alive when that verse was written. That verse was written thousands of years ago. And it is true that verse was not written for me. It wasn't written about the thing I'm trying to decide about. But you know what? That verse is speaking to me. And I think I'm hearing God's, God's Word through Scripture. And I believe that God is showing me what to do through this verse. I think another way God calls us is what we might say a, a slow confirmation. We walk in a certain direction and we get more light. Let's say you have an accident and you're knocked out, maybe a car accident, and you wake up and there's just a little bit of daylight. You don't know how long you've been knocked out. You know what that means? It means you don't know if it's late afternoon or if it's early morning. All you know is there's just a little bit of light. Is it the light of early morning? Is it the dawn? Or is it the light of dusk? Is it the light of early evening? How do you know? Well, you can ask somebody, is this morning or evening? Or you can wait. If it gets brighter, you know it's the morning. If it gets darker, you know it's the evening. Very, very simple. You just wait. Well, how do you know if God is calling you? How do you know if you're on the right path? Very simple. If you go down a certain path and you get more light, more confirmation from the Lord, you're going in the right direction. If you go down that path and God becomes more distant and you're getting less light and less confirmation, you're going the wrong way. Turn around and go the other way. Do I have a verse for that? I do. Proverbs 4.18. If you read Proverbs 4.18, you'll see that principle. The path of the just, the right path, the path that a righteous person is on, gets brighter and brighter. It's like the light of dawn. It gets brighter and brighter. Proverbs 4.18. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Maybe there are 300 or 400 ways that God can call us, and I've mentioned three or four of them. But here's what you need to remember. God is responsible 
to let you know what He wants you to do. You don't have to discover some magic way to find that out. You're not going to miss it if you're willing to do it. If you're willing to do God's will, you will know God's will. If you're not willing to do God's will, maybe you're not going to know it. But God is responsible to show you. You're responsible to be willing. And you're also responsible to respond to the light that you have. Light obeyed brings more light. Light rejected brings on night. What does that mean? It means that when God shows you a little light, if you're obedient to the light that you have, you will get more light. If you're disobedient to the light that you have, why should God show you anything else? He's just bringing condemnation on you. Proverbs 16, 3 says, Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Psalm, I think it's Psalm, it's either Psalm 30, 36, it's either Psalm 36 or Psalm 16, I can't remember, it says, In your light we see light. You know, the Word of God is like a lantern or a flashlight. The British call it a torch. We call it a flashlight. This little thing that you hold and you shine it on the ground. When you're out in the dark and you've got a flashlight, you see to, to, to take the next step. Well, what, what happens when you take the next step? Well, then you can see to take the next step. But you can't see four or five steps down the line. You can only see the next step. But if you take the next step, then you'll see the next step, and a hundred steps, and a thousand steps. Well, the light of God's will is like that. Take the next step. When you take the next step, then you will see the next step. But sometimes we have to wait a while. These apostles waited a while. They tried all kinds of things which didn't work. It didn't work with Barnabas. It didn't work in Asia Minor. It didn't work in the places they'd went, gone before, except for Lystra. But now they get a new direction. Now they turn west. You know, scholars talk about something called the West. Your country is a little bit different because you are a part of Europe and a part of Asia. You are the eastern part of the West. You know, I think you used to be a part of the West, and I think maybe communism tried to hijack the West and say you weren't a part of the West, you are a part of something else. But I think your heritage really is a part of the West. And people who write books and people who teach in universities they debate over what the West really is and what the secret is to the West. People who don't believe the Bible, people who hate Christianity, say that the West is the product of Greek democracy and Roman law. That Greek democracy and Roman law have defined the West. People who believe the Bible and people who are sympathetic to Christianity say that the West has been defined by the Judeo-Christian tradition. That the thing which has made the West great and the thing which is the most valuable in the West flows from the truth that we find in the Bible. The truth originally believed by the Jews and ultimately taught in missions by the Christians. Well, I want to say that Acts 16, one of the reasons I think it's so important, and one of the reasons I think we need to study it, and one of the th reasons I think that um, it's one of the most important chapters, not only in the book of Acts, but in the history of literature, is because I believe that what we have in Acts 16 is not only a record of the second missionary journey, is not only an account of the missionary efforts of Paul and Silas and Timothy, but what we have recounted to us in Acts 16 is nothing less than the story of the birth of the West. That's what it's about, and that's what comes from it.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com